place of authenticity as a kiddo and then just being androgynous to starting to really accept that there was a certain amount of um, sacrifice I had to make in terms of playing the game of you know being a woman um, because that was the body that I was in and so I really threw myself into the role of being a woman and even you know went as far as to identify as a lipstick lesbian. I mean, the whole nine yards. Makeup, high heels, long hair. And I was really good at it too, it was totally hot. But it was, that was the validation for me was that sense of my body as object and my body as beautiful object. And when I got so much approval and so much attention and so much acceptance from that, I started to really feel like, God, is this the only way I can move in the world and, and really be loved, is to have to wear these things and do these things. And slowly but surely, you know, I started to kind of really resent people going, God, you're really beautiful, and you know, wow, you're really pretty, and all of that stuff, and, and really resent like them not seeing the true me, because I wasn't showing it to them. I've always been a tomboy, and then from a tomboy, you know, to kind of a dyke, and now from a dyke to a genderqueer person. And I think there was a couple times in my life where I really tried to embrace femininity, but they were pretty short-lived periods of time. I started kind of coming to terms with the fact that I was trans last fall, so since then, there's been a lot of me really trying to express that dual masculinity, femininity in a more true way, in a way that just feels more, more real to me. I, it's interesting, as I am able to be more outright in identifying as masculine, I feel more comfortable in exploring my own femininity and the parts of me that are feminine. I spent a long time being pretty tortured and tormented, presenting in a more masculine fashion. A few years ago, I, I kind of went through the coming out process of living in the closet for several years in my early 20s of at home presenting the way that I choose to present in public now, wearing makeup and wearing dresses and, and lingerie and things like that. But then over the past few years, it just became a thing that I could no longer keep just in my bedroom and I had to live it in order to feel genuine as a human and in order to just feel, feel like I wasn't carrying around this burden of a secret. societal expectation to fit in, right? Especially for women. There's so many constraints on what is acceptable as a woman to look and be and act and do. And I'm so glad that it's starting to slowly relax and unravel, but it's it's been a process. 
I think societally. So from that, I was done. I was done with doing the femme, holistic lesbian thing. And this really came about during a time when I was in a relationship with a transgender man. And I vacillated between um, really playing up that feminine side to counter kind of to counter his masculinity. And it was even to a point that I would actually dress in feminine drag in order to help him pass. Ugh. Once I realized that, you know, my identity of, as a lesbian was really coming to an end because I was in a relationship with a man at that point, I mourned that I had somehow gotten into a relationship with someone who, uh, who wasn't a woman and didn't identify as a woman, but still wanted me to be a woman. And I was like, there's something not right about this. So um, that relationship ended and I spent a lot of time um, by myself, living alone, and just allowing myself to become. It was a slow process of about five years. And, um, and there was finally a point where I was actually um, in my yoga teacher training where I was looking in the mirror eight hours a day every day and the pose looked right but the body looked wrong and I was like wait a minute shit <laughs> I mean, there was definitely times whenever I was in like middle school, early high school, where I would put clothes on that would like, you know, make me look more feminine and show my tits off. And I felt so awful about it the whole time, but it was just like what everyone else was doing. And it was comfortable in a sense to where if I was wearing what made me comfortable, I stood out. So I wore what other people wanted. And that's the only way that I can really even think of how I would express my, my gender identity is through clothing, through like how I'm physically presenting myself to the world. So it has changed. I, I tried to conform for a second and then it felt real weird to put for my boobies to be out. It was strange. <laughs> but as I got older, I realized, you know, you just kind of, eventually come to terms with who you are and you just stop trying to do that. So now that I'm a full grown adult, you know, this is it. It's not changing anymore, I think. When I was a little kid, I was like a, the biggest little tomboy ever. I think middle school and high school it's such a formative time in people's lives and they really look to, you know, society and to their peers to um, help them identify who they are. I kind of went through, I call it like my, my girly stage then where I was, I was very feminine or more so, um, you know, and it was, it was kind of awkward for me. I think, but everyone has awkward high school years. Like no one ever feels comfortable with who they are in high school. They're just kind of learning about it. You know, being in the military and stuff, I've started, I think, to care less about what society, you know, what other people think. And I've just started to be more of myself. And so I've really started to, I don't know, present more of who I feel I am, which is like a very masculine female. And so began my journey of going, okay, I need to address the physical body that I'm in to, to make it congruent with how I feel inside. And there was a lot of mourning around that, a lot of fear around that. And it was mostly the fear of allowing myself to be who I was and allowing people to see who I was. And, and just trusting, taking it on faith that they would still love me and understand me and get me. I actually waited to, st to take any sort of steps towards transition. And I, I use steps loosely because a gender transition is different for every single person. And this is only my story. And some people choose to take hormones and some people choose to do surgery and some people don't and it's all valid. But I knew for me, like I needed to take those steps um, personally. 
but I waited and waited and waited and waited and waited because the idea of taking the steps towards hormonal transition was a departure from everything that I'd ever known. And I knew that on some level, but I waited until I was so depressed that I was suicidal. My wife was basically like, okay, like we're done with this. We can't do this anymore. Let's take you in. And so I got on some antidepressants. I got, I got on some anti-anxiety meds and eventually I got my letter from a therapist and got testosterone. It hasn't been a silver bullet by any means, um, but taking the steps has been um, really freeing. My gender identity has changed over the course of my life quite a bit. I was very gender neutral as a kid. Once I went through puberty, I tried to present in a more feminine way. And once I came out as queer, I tried to appear more masculine because I thought that that's what queer girls were supposed to look like. And it sort of wavered back and forth across the spectrum. Within the last couple of years, just being more aware of gender, I've sort of tried to master more of the gender neutral appearance just to feel most comfortable with myself. It has and it hasn't changed over the course of my life. Um, it's changed some in that now I can, I have some words for how I feel. Like I have words like gender fluid and I have words like queer and gender queer. I have, I have words like pansexual, like, you know, there, there's words now so I feel more defined. And when I was younger, I just figured that I was straight and I would like, you know, I would have fluid thoughts or fantasies, but I figured that they were just fantasies. I didn't want to pursue them and I wouldn't like them if I did. For a little while I, I wore more masculine clothing and liked to play around with that and but now I have some health conditions where my skin is very finicky and my body is very finicky about what I put on and so a suit would be torturous you know, or even a belt is torturous or men's shoes so I pretty much just wear whatever is comfortable right now so I don't always get to express my gender as much as I would like and some feminine clothing aren't too comfortable either so a lot of it's limited by my body and my health at this point there's kind of an intersection there and it's just not as expressive as I would like but you know I find my ways. As I became more masculinized there was this smaller process of, you know, going from I have to be a man, and what is a man, and I must do the man things, and really uh, shaming myself for having feminine attributes um, and trying to eradicate those feminine attributes. And then after a while, I was like, what am I doing? You know, I never wanted to um, sort of divorce myself from my experience, my feminine experience of the world for 30 years. Like I never, this is just a continuation of who I am. And it was important to me too, like moving into a space of being male passing and occupying a space of privilege of being, you know, a white male that I remember what it is like to be a woman. Because so many men lack that experience and lack that knowledge and lack that understanding and it's been detrimental I think to our, to our society as a whole. So I never wanted to forget what it was like. There's a quote, you can't, you can't be what you can't see. And so as I've gotten to see different images and whatnot, and it's helped me change those images. I went to to coming, having, and I don't want to box people in, but um, like the, the softball like kind of um, attire at one point, and then the the rebel girl phase. Um, I went through a, a lot of different phases of expressing femininity because I was still not identifying as something along the trans spectrum because I didn't think that that was available for me. I was a woman and 
I was a punk woman or a butch woman. I tried to be a trans man at one point, um, but I found myself getting hyper-masculine, uh, becoming things that I didn't want to take on, a burden of masculinity that I didn't want either. So now I've, I've been able to really explore and find a healthy balance of being a limp wristed fag sometimes, you know, and kind of owning that. I've gotten called a fag a million times. Um, but owning that, knowing that I'm a feminine, masculine person. Masculinity, of course, and then limp wristed stuff every now and then. I don't know where it's gonna go, uh, where my gender expression is gonna go, but. It's definitely evolved and it's been a healing evolution. The intention of Roaming Gender is to offer a platform for any and all folks to share their story on the intersectionality of their gender, race, class, ability, sexual orientation, religion, age, and nationality. If you're interested in participating in Roaming Gender, submit your contact info at www.roamingender.com. Feeling safe in sharing your story publicly is a privilege that not everyone has. If you're interested in sharing your story anonymously, I encourage you to still apply to participate in the project. To donate to the Roaming Gender fundraising campaign, please visit our Indiegogo page. Don't forget to share and subscribe to our channel in order to catch the next week's episode. Keep an eye out for Roaming Gender's merch collaboration with Tomboy Society, T-shirts Without Boundaries. Transform is Austin's only queer-centric, trans-focused fitness center. Check out their schedule at www.transformfitnessaustin.com.